can start after let's say 20 seconds hello everyone welcome to the first lecture of unit 3 during this the next hour uh, i'll introduce the concept of synthesis i'll start with the very 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 basic what is synthesis uh, what does the process do what does it need and most importantly where does the process of synthesis fit in the asic design flow we would also look at the design compiler family from synopsis which i believe all of you would be using in your project works and assignments and further when you go into the industry synopsis design compiler is in fact the most popular tool of choice for synthesis there are uh, other tools also like kdn chartil compiler there's magma uh, but we'll we'll focus our uh, all the commands we discuss all the scripts we see will be uh, focused to synopsis design compiler however it should not be a major problem in switching to a different tool if you want to if the need arises because the concepts remain same only few commands are different from one tool to other otherwise everything else remain same so uh, what is synthesis uh, synthesis uh, by definition means uh, combining pre existing elements to form something new or in other words you can also say that uh, synthesis is nothing but uh, conversion of an idea into implementation we introduce one more thing called logic synthesis again logic synthesis is combining primitive logic functions to form a design netlist that meets a functional and design goal so uh, here on the left hand side we see uh, a jigsaw puzzle which is jumbled up each of the component is labeled as tp uh, tp means a technology primitive this could either be a rtl written in verilog or vsdl and then uh, we want that verilog or vsdl to be converted into a gate level netlist which would again be sent to fabrication and this process of conversion is called synthesis obviously it should meet some of the goals for example let's say we are working on a processor from intel now that processor each processor from any any company will have some frequency goal let's say uh, the goal is it should meet 1 gigahertz so that is our goal so whatever design we do whatever technology node we choose we have to make sure that the processor meets the criteria of 1 gigahertz frequency so that is an example of a goal the output is netlist uh, plus a lot of other files which is go to physical design tools and then layout is done and they are they are sent to foundry the concept of automated design is uh, theoretically it is possible to convert any digital function to a logic circuit this is what is done by the synthesis tool it automatically synthesizes circuit from function description for example on the left hand side you have a logic function that is equal to a or b and c or d and e now this is a this is this statement on the left hand side is uh, written into a high level language it could be verilog or vsdl so the tool will read this and it will convert this to something represented by the right hand side which is a logic circuit this is a very simple simplistic explanation of the process now we have we are assuming some things here one thing we are assuming is that the standard cells that is the cells the logics uh, like in the previous uh, example the or gates the two or gates and the three input nand gate they are assuming their existence so if primitive standard cells are previously designed we are assuming that these cells are previously designed that is we have a library which contains all these cells and we have the functional description of these cells we have the timing uh, specifications of these cells we have the layout of these cells that means everything is already designed we could build a large number of various digital circuits using these parts so the group of primitive cells which are used to build larger circuits is called standard cell library 
Now, building a standard cell library is a completely independent subject on its own. It, it uh, involves a lot of size analysis, layouts, and all that. So, during this course and during your project work and assignment, we will be assuming that we have a library of standard cells available with us, and we will simply use that library to create circuits of choice for our application. In the next uh, lecture, we will actually spend a lot of time on understanding how the standard cell library data is represented, what files do we need, what do those files contain, so we will see a lot of that. But we will uh, assume that everything is available for us, we just have to start on the design. Now, Synopsys has a uh, library available for university students, it is a 90 nanometer generic library. Which can be used for project works and assignments. Now, why synthesis? Why can't we start with? Uh, why can't we hook the the? Let's assume uh, you have to design a decoder. Let's say three three to eight decoder. What we saw in the book, an example of that. And now uh, there can be two approaches. First approach can be that I uh, I know what a decoder looks like. What the logic circuit looks like, I can draw it on paper. Then I can go to the library and choose the, the cells, the appropriate cells, hook them up, form the netlist myself, and then proceed through the, the physical design part. Second approach, which is a high level approach, I would, what I would do, I would write an HDL, which is uh, I would write an HDL in, in Verilog, let us say in Verilog I write something like this for the decoder. I use synthesis to convert this into a netlist, into a gate level netlist and then again proceed for, for, for physical design. This is possible only for very, very small design or very specific design or some very special circuits where you do not want the regular digital design synthesis code you will find that not useful, but otherwise for all big designs, huge designs, big chips, uh, obviously drawing circuit by hand is not at all possible, plus uh, the tools nowadays are very sophisticated in terms that of that they can choose what best cell, what cell would suit best for let us say different type of code, for let us say you want a lower area, so it would choose a different cell when compared to when you want a faster circuit and the complexity keeps on increasing as you go one level down. So, an SDL for a will have let us say for a full chip an SDL will have a few hundred files with some thousands of lines of code and then when it goes through gate level it expands into a million gates which are hooked up together. Again, when it goes to now, since gate level database is not the one that is manufactured, it uh, we convert this gate level database into a transistor level schematic using physical design tools, and then this again the each gate will have a let's say n number of cells. We saw that a two input NAND gate is comprised of four uh, CMOS of, of two NMOS plus two PMOS. That means four transistors. So similarly, let's say you have a 1 million design gate, gate level netlist, it will, it will translate easily into a 5 to 6 million transistor count. Again this transistor count is then converted into polygons which is nothing but layout. So layout uh, we also call them as polygons because ultimately they are just a bunch of rectangles, squares, uh, different type of polygons which represent different layers of the chip. So some polygons will represent the metal layer, some will represent the poly layer and so on. So, as we go down the uh, hierarchy, as the number, so the number of elements increases exponentially, the complexity also increases and dealing with a higher complex, a, a very complex design in the sense of let us say if you are working on gate level netlist, that will take more effort time and cost when compared to working on an HDL. We will see that the, the, the differences that 
is there any need when we need to work on a gate level network? Yes, there is a need when sometimes we need to directly work on gate level network. But most of the time, for our course, purpose of our course, we'll start with an SDN. Almost always, we'll start with a web log or the SDN description of a design, and then proceed for synthesis. I would also assume that uh, almost all of you should be familiar with the log. Uh, we will whatever code we see here will be the log because it is the most popular language of the right now and presently. There are VSDL users also, but uh, I would restrict my uh, slides or codes to Verilog. So, if somebody is not familiar with Verilog, I would suggest that they read up Verilog. Um, it's not a com uh, to start with it. You could, you could start in a two or three days. You could read about it and start coding. It's not a uh, big problem. And then uh, you come back to this lecture so that you can understand it better. Not this uh, uh, lecture in particular, but all the Coming lectures which discuss synthesis. Now, logic synthesis is divided into three parts. The first part is called translation, second part is called mapping, and the last part is called optimizing. The first part, the translation, is the is the name given to the process of converting the HDL description into something called a GTEC. Netlist. So GTEC is a term specific to synopsis. GTEC means generic Boolean. So now let's say uh, so the hardware description language, the web log code on the left hand side, this this code here would be uh, pricing of a higher level language construct, if else case statements, always blocks, and so on. So this SDL here, the art here, is actually technology independent. That means it does not matter what technology mode we are targeting for. The RTL does not need to represent that. When I talk about technology node, I mean, let's say we are targeting either 90 nanometer or 65 nanometer, where the uh, the nanometer length is the the transistor channel length. So each technology node mode, for example, a 90 nanometer technology mode. There are response to the manufacturing process where the channel length of NMOS and PMOS is 90 nanometer. So uh, when we start, when we go for for decide deciding a chip, or deciding a uh, then then we have to choose a technology mode. But when we write the RTL, when we write a high, high level description language, the design is technology independent. When it goes through translation, it gets converted into something called GTEC method. The generic Boolean netlist, and this netlist also is technology independent. That means, till the process of translation, till the till this this generic Boolean, we are not concerned about what technology we are going to get our design manufactured in. Right now, we are only concerned about the logic that is represented by the RTL. The second process, the second part of the process is mapping. Mapping is the process where design compiler will map the GTEC Boolean into the gates available in your library. Here is where the technology comes in. So let's say uh, I am targeting a product for a 90 nanometer technology. I would have a 90 nanometer standard cell library with me. Now that standard cell library will contain a lot of cells, different types of hands or man or inverter, buffers and so on. And now this generic Boolean will be mapped into this uh, gate level netlist. And the last part, which is the optimization, will make sure that all the goals that we have specified in terms of performance, area and power are met. Now let's say the same design. I want to. I have manufactured in 90 nanometer. Now I want to. I want to go to 65 nanometer. The first part, that is translation, will remain same. It won't change because the generic boolean is not changing. It is same. Irrespective of technology, it is same. It is simply a collection of gates that design compiler. The gates that are available in design compiler. They are not linked to any technology. 
they are generic. So the, the, the first process will not change. The second process will change because the 69 nanometer library would be different from 90 nanometer library. And because the second part is changing, the mapping part is changing, the optimization will also change because now although the goals might be same, but the underlying cells are different. So the optimization of that part would be optimization carried out by design compiler on a 65 nanometer design will can and can be and will be different from the one in 90 nanometer. Now, first we start with the functional description. It is written in a hardware description language, that log or VHDL, or we also call it call it RTL, the register transfer level. Most of the designs which you will practice hands on will be synchronous. Synchronous means there will be a clock, all the handshake between different parts of the design will be based on a clock signal. The, the very big advantage of a synchronous design is a reliable behavior. This thing is very, very important. Simplified standard verification, we will see that in further in, in unit 3 and unit 4. What do we mean by this? It simplifies optimization algorithm. Again, this is again a derivative of this fact in simplified time, timing verification. Optimal results, uh, it is very easy to set goals for a synchronous design as compared to an asynchronous design. Asynchronous design is very, very difficult to verify and to meet timing. So it is recommended that whatever design problem we have, we try to solve it in the synchronous domain and so that goal setting and optimization would be easier. Again the way we code RTN it affects the results. We will see that in another coming slide how do we write better codes and how do we make sure that uh, this one very, very very famous saying is that when we write RTL we should think in terms of hardware not in terms of software. That is, let's say we are writing a case statement. We should think that what that case statement will translate into after synthesis. What type of hardware will it consume? So, a lot of uh, the area of the design, the performance of the design, a lot depends on how do we write the code. So, the process of translation now we see in detail. The process of translation will cover all these things. It will do SGL syntax and rule check. It will optimize SGL. Uh, we will see, we'll see a few reports. How does it do that? It will map arithmetic functions. For example, let's say you are writing A plus B. You are writing C is equal to A plus B. So that plus looks very simple in Verilog, but that plus translates to an adder in hardware. That adder would be mapped to a GTEC adder, a, a generic Boolean adder. This is what is meant by arithmetic function mapping. Sequential function mapping, whenever you have a always block that represents a flip flop or a latch, that particular register will be mapped to a generic flip flop or a generic latch. Then there will be combination function mapping, that is mapping of and and odds. All this mapping is done still done at generic Boolean scale, at a GTEx scale. The second and third uh, parts of the process are combined together, we call it mapping or optimization. It maps Boolean functions to technology specific primitive functions. It modifies mapping to meet design goals. So this part here, this part here is actually the optimization part. So when it says it modifies mapping, so the first, at first path synthesis will just map the generic Boolean, generic Boolean it will map it to a target technology and then in the next pass it will start optimizing. It will start looking at your clock frequency, it will start looking at the, at the timing which is given in the, the library files, it will start looking at the area of the design, it will start optimizing the design for, for all these, these four parameters. So these four parameters are the key and they are in fact in order of priority. 
So the design rules come first. We look into detail what design rules mean. Just a hint, it means that the gates, the logic circuit, the individual gates, let's say ANDs and all, NANDs and all, they are not driving any load which is beyond their capability. This should be met first up. If design rules are not met, the timing is not reliable. So for timing to be reliable, design rules have to be met first up. So this is the highest priority. This goes number one. Timing goes number two. Because if timing is not met, it is not guaranteed that design will function correctly. Area goes number three. That's the last, almost the second last. Since uh, we have to first make sure that the circuit is accurate and is accurately timed, then only we should talk about area. Third comes area. And again, last comes power, but power can be given higher priority in some cases. Uh, so the priorities of these are dynamic, but this is the general rule design rules, timing, area, and power. The process of optimization is constraint driven. So there are few statements uh, written here create clock, set input delay, set output delay, set max area. Uh, don't fret too much about it. Just, uh, the first three lines represent the timing goal. The last line, max area zero, represents the area goal. It just tells the tool that just work hardest. I mean, uh, saying set max area zero will actually not result into a zero area. It's just a method of telling the tool that do your best job. So what the tool will do, it will try and meet timing. And for a design represented by the top three lines, and for that, let's say there are n number of configurations, which all of let's say there are five configurations, five types of different gate level netbits, all of them meeting the first three statements. Among these five, the tool will choose the one which has lowest gate. That is meant by set max area zero. So now we see a, a very nice graph here. On the x-axis is the delay. Or you could also call it the performance of the design. On the y axis, we have area. Now, uh, for a, if you to go from left to right, that is, the delay is increasing, that is, the performance is going down, and the area is also going down. If we come to the, uh, if we go, if see the lower area, the small area, this, this quadrant here, this is. So for a smaller area, the delay, uh, sorry, for the larger area, the delay will be shorter. So, if uh, so, these two are uh, fighting each other. The area and the delay always fight each other. There's one more angle to it called power. But let's let's simplify and see it, area and delay first. Now, if you want to reduce area, what you would do is you would add more sequential, uh, more sequencing. That is, let's say you have a decoder kind of example. The more parallel paths you have, the larger will be your area and it will be faster. But if you increase the number of stages, the area will be less, but the circuit will be slower. And again, uh, uh, if, if, even if we talk about the cell design, the cells which are faster and have better drive strength are always bigger in area because again their W by L ratio would be high. They will probably have inbuilt inverter or buffer stages. So, these two things, area and delay, are always fighting each other. And the optimization, the process of optimization is entirely dependent on the constraint feature. So the, the set of four statements here, these four statements are what we call constraints. Same function can be represented by a different circuit. Uh, we, we see that. You could have a NAND or based circuit. You could you could always have an AND or based circuit. Let's say in a MUX based design, you could actually use a simple MUX, or you could implement a MUX using AND gates and or gates. So, and different circuits will have different physical parameters. The tool will choose what to take based on our constraints. So, let's say you have a function y is equal to a and b and c and d. 
the variate one on the left hand side is a is a circuit where the first stage uses two input AND gates, the second stage uses a a three input AND gate, a three input AND gate. On the right hand side, you have a four input AND gate, and there's one two input AND gate. The the power number and the area numbers are just uh, some uh, some random numbers here. They are, they are, they do not represent actual. Uh, they just tell that what is higher and what is lower in power and area. So obviously the four input AND gate, if you actually go and draw the the CMOS circuit of a four input AND gate, you will see that it is a pretty large circuit. Correspondingly the two input and the three input cards are lower in area. So we see that the, the variant to area is higher, but power is lower or let us say comparable to variant one. So depend and again if you we see this one more important thing is that if we see the delay from E to Y in variant 2, the delay from E to Y, let me change the color here. The delay from E to Y just crosses one AND gate, but delay from assuming this is E, the delay from E to Y here crosses two AND gates or you could also say E is here again it will be but so the delay from E to Y would be different in variant 1 and variant 2. Now the constraint with that we give on E will also determine what variant will be picked up. So that the table here uh, shows that it shows the representative power and area numbers for cells. So obviously a two input AND gate will have the lowest power and the lowest area, a three input will have more power and more area when compared to the two input again as we keep increasing the number of input in a, in a gate the power and area keeps on increasing. It does not mean that gates which have a number of inputs higher than two or three are undesirable that will again depend on our, our delay requirements. So obviously uh, let us say a three input and gate the delay from A to up from input 1 to output, from input 2 to output, from input 3 to output, all will be similar in nature. Whereas, let us say if you have, if you try and use always a two input AND gate or, a, or two input gates, you will see that the delay keeps on increasing since you are, you will be adding more stages to your combination logic. So, this is where what we say that, this is why we say that the delay. And area are always fighting each other. So the more number of stages you have in a combinational path, it will be slower, but it will have lower area. If you decrease number of stages and increase the parallelism, you will have more area, but faster circuit. So the let's let's see what optimization trade-offs are. So the circuit, as we saw, the circuit design goals are the first goal is obvious, that is it should be design rule. Then comes timing, so we should have small delays, that is our goal. Power, we should have lower power consumption and smaller area. Now, you cannot meet all three if all, all three are very aggressive. So, circuit design is a trade off of timing, area, and power. Optimal design, when we say optimal design, it means that it meets all our goals, is found as a result of synthesis based on the priority set by design. So let us say there is a CPU, let us say there is an 8 bit CPU or 8 bit, 8 bit, 8 bit MIPS microprocessor design of that. Now let us say I synthesize it for a 400 megahertz target and then I again synthesize it for a 600 megahertz target. What do you think will have more area? Obviously, the 600 megahertz will have more area because I am asking the tool to give me more performance, but there will be some cost, and the cost is area and obviously the power. So, 600 megahertz microprocessor netlist will have more area and more power when compared to a 400 megahertz design. This is what is meant by the priority set by design. For example, when the delays are small, the power consumption is high. And vice versa. 
circuit variant variant is chosen on the basis of the importance of one parameter against the other. So, in fact, the most complex part of synthesis is actually setting the goals. You have the goals in mind, but then we have to translate those goals into a number of commands given to the synthesis tool. This is the most important and most difficult part of synthesis. How to make sure that whatever goals we have on paper are given correctly to the tool. So the goals, the design goals, timing area power are defined by something called constraints. So constraints are the set of rules that will set limits on circuit parameters and it will set priorities. So during synthesis process, every time there is a choice, every time the tool has a choice between several circuit variants, the one meeting your constraints is always chosen. So you could say in other words that uh, synthesis is nothing but an optimization problem. So if you go back to uh, uh, most of you would have uh, studied the course of optimization. And uh, in optimization, there's a very famous and a very interesting problem called a traveling salesman problem. So if you haven't read about it, uh, please, please read about it. It's a very interesting concept. It tells that uh, it tries to solve a problem of a traveling salesman. He has to travel, let's say, through 10 cities. So now the goal is the goal, the goal can be multifold. One could be a traveling cost, other could be a traveling time. Now let's say, uh, so you be assigned that, okay, if he goes from A to B, the cost is let's say X, if he goes from B to C, the cost is let's say Y, and so on. This is a problem. Now there's an algorithm which tends to solve this traveling salesman problem and optimizes the total cost. Exactly same thing happens in synthesis. The constraints set a goal and the tool will try to optimize the circuit based on the constraints. So it's nothing but an optimization problem. And every optimization problem depends on the goals we give. Next we see something called environment attributes. Uh, environment parameters and net, net attributes affect circuit operation. Now we saw in synthesis we have been talking about picking up gates. We are not talking about how how they are connected together. That means what are the parameters of the interconnect, the copper interconnect connected together. Please note the interconnect information is only estimated during synthesis. It is never accurate because the circuit, the, inter the accurate information, interconnect information only comes after physical design, after the layout is done. So in the process of synthesis, we do not have the layout information obviously. So any interconnect information we provide is based on some estimates. We will see what those estimates are. The synthesis steps need to account for such such estimates for correct results. So we should provide provide this data. One thing which we know for sure will be environmental parameters. That is, we we know that our design should work at a particular voltage, temperature, and some process variations. The net attributes. The parasitic resistance and capacitance are at best estimates at this point, at the point of synthesis, but we should provide something. It should not be taken as zero. It's, it will be inaccurate. So the environment parameters here, very interesting concept, let's see. So this figure here tells what goes as input to synthesis and what comes as output. Logic synthesis tool, we give it the RTL code. Okay, let's let's go in order in which we will actually do the process. So the first thing that we need to set up, we need to decide is this: what technology are we targeting, and then provide that particular cell library to synthesis. Second, we should know what are the environment attributes. That is, what are the operating conditions we are targeting? Are we targeting a 1.0 volt? Are we targeting 1.2 volt? This will affect synthesis, and actually. This will affect this also because environment attributes that is voltage process and temperature actually also determine the cell library. Usually you have the, the because the timing of the standard cell 
let's say timing of an AND gate will change depending on what is the voltage, what process are we talking about and what is the temperature. So by fixing the environment attribute we also fix the cell library and in turn we provide the library information and the operating condition to the tool. Then we go on and, and give the tool our RTL code and then we define the we give this and then we give this, we give the constraints. These are the inputs. What comes out is this. What comes out is a gate level netlist in Verilog uh, or VSDL. Uh, then let's say Verilog. So uh, the gate level netlist would be in Verilog, and then this uh, gate level netlist goes to the physical design tool, the physical synthesis tool, where actually the uh, the netlist, the gates are laid out. The wires that the actual wires are drawn, drawn. Routing takes place and so many things happen. The uh, as far as this course is concerned we will not be looking at this. Our job is to make sure that we get, get a correct gate level netlist out from the logic synthesis tool. So we would be looking at cell library in the next lecture we will go into details of how a cell library looks like, what does it contain. We will see how to specify environment attributes, we will see examples of uh, this course does not teach very long, it assumes that you know very long, but we will go through the good practices of Redlock coding of RTL coding, what type of code results into what type of hardware, we will look a lot into constraints, this is the most important part and we will look very heavily, we will invest very heavily into this. We will see how to specify this and obviously, obviously we will see the, the commands related to all of these processes. Now let us see where does design compiler fit in, a, in an ASIC design flow. So uh, the ASIC design flow is something like this, obviously we start with an architecture, the architecture will tell the scope and the, the problem description for example let us say uh, we want to make. Uh, we want to design a, an 8 bit risk processor. This is the design, this is the problem statement. Now we would go and finalize the architecture what type of registers will it, will it contain, what frequency are we targeting, that will in turn decide what technology node we should choose, and so on. Then we will start coding. So we will start writing the, the microprocessor code in Verilog. So which is the SJ description. Then now since we have let us go to back to the previous slide, we have this RTL code, we have the cell library since we chose the technology, we have environment attribute. We will go on and there is one more process which comes, uh, this is not represented here, is the functional verification simulation. That is, we have to first make sure that whatever we have written in Verilog actually confirms to the functionality that we defined in our, in our architecture. So this is again a separate very big field of which is called verification that is you make sure by using some test stimulus that the RTL code, the Verilog code actually performs according to the function, functional expectations. So once we have made sure that the RTL actually is verified 100 percent we go to synthesis, we could also use synthesis for design exploration, obviously you do not need it to be passing 100 percent verification, you could also do that, many people do that. So we go to design compiler, in design compiler there is a tool called SDL compiler which actually reads the dialog and, and does um, few things, it checks syntax and all, then is, it goes to GTEC, it does timing optimization, data path optimization, power optimization. So design compiler is nothing but a bouquet of tools, so inside design compiler you have SDL compiler, you have power compiler for power optimization, in area optimization then if you want to add some DFT features yet there is a DFT compiler, and timing closure and so on. So the, the loop here, this loop actually shows that this process is iterative in the sense that if you do not meet your power or timing or area goals, you go back you either go back to RTL or you go back to your 
of goals, you reset the, you change the goals, you modify them, and you make sure that this whole process is passing. The input to this process is constraints. Uh, this, the, the file format is called SDT. You'll see this. Design where library, we'll see what design where means. Uh, technology library, symbol library, and so on. Don't worry too much about def for now. So the output is optimized netlist. This optimized netlist goes to some physical design tool. One example is IC compiler, something like this. It goes to place and route. And now we have to also make sure that the netlist here, optimized netlist here, is equivalent in functionality to the RTL here. These two are equivalent. We have to make sure. This does not mean, please note, this does not mean that the tool here, the Synopsys design compiler tool here has some problem. It can mean that whatever RTL, whatever SDL description we wrote is not actually good enough to produce a good netlist. There can be many, many reasons why these two are not equal. These two are not equal. There can be many, many reasons why these two are not equal. But we will see we will see in the process of synthesis that what could those reasons be. But we have to make sure that these two are equivalent. The process is called formal verification. Formality, we'll look a bit into this in this course. Uh, we'll see why this is called formal and what is the difference between formal and uh, stimulus based. So just a note that uh, you could now somebody could ask that uh, during the verification of my RTL code, I have a test, I have a stimulus. Now I can use the same stimulus on a netlist and make sure that a functionality is correct. Yes, you can do it, but form formal verification is a much more sophisticated and much more accurate way of doing it. Please hold this thought for a while. Now the high level, we, we go a bit deep into, the flowchart goes a bit deep into the high level design flow. So you have design data preparation, which includes SDL coding, constraint generation, library development. We will not be looking into library development. We are assume, assuming that library is already provided to us. Then we go into goal specification and functional simulation, what I was talking about. There is a tool called DC Explorer, which will help you in doing some design exploration. We will not go into that. Uh, we have to make sure that uh, the design needs, uh, it is within 10% of time goals, and that's an arbitrary requirement. Uh, then we go to design compiler. The first process, what it tells here, is actually the design exploration stage. That is, many times when you are starting a fresh design, you are not even sure what goals should be set. So this this process actually helps us a lot. It helps us in uh, using the DC Explorer. It, DC Explorer, what it does is it will it will do a very basic flow planning because any uh, feedback on how the design will look after place and route needs to have some Total information. So the design explorer will DC explorer it helps you in total in the design. But we are not going into that. Uh, just make a note that the process here, this the first half, will help us in setting the goal. Now uh, we have the SDL design ready. We have the goal ready. Now we go to design compiler. And again, the the flowchart tells us that if we do not meet our goals either before physical design or after physical design, we have to go back to design compiler. And either modify our goals or modify our design. One of these. Now let's look uh, at the design compiler family. The, the first and foremost a tool we are looking at is DC Expert. So you don't have to actually start up uh, different tools. Uh, uh, so when you start design compiler, we call it DC Shell. This is not a single tool. It is, has a bunch of tools inside it. So all commands will work there for all the tools. So you don't have to worry about invoking different tools for different applications. Uh, obviously, for each tool has something uh, needs a license. For example, DC Expert needs a license. We we'll see there's one more tool called DC Expert. So each I'll call them as feature. Each feature needs a separate license. Something like that. So depending on what licenses do you have available with you, those features will be available available in your in your design compiling your DC shell. So DC export is a basic uh, synthesis compiler. It provides optimization for area timing power. 
using via node models for delay estimation. Via node models uh, estimate the interconnect delay. We we'll see what, what they look like. So what capabilities this tool has? It provides hierarchical compile that is top down or bottom up. We'll see in detail what, what does that mean. It gives full and incremental compile techniques. Uh, sequential of it does sequential optimization for complex flip flops and that is. We saw time borrowing, so it is able to do that for large bit designs. Timing analysis, any synthesis tool could be able to do basic timing analysis to make sure the timing is meeting. We'll see a lot more of that. It has command line interface and graphical user interface. First up, when we start any tool, we are tempted by the graphical user interface. But for tools like design compiler and time, time uh, you would be heavily using the text based interface. Uh, I personally favor text based interface because it gives a lot of reporting capability. The graphical user interface is only useful to see the circuit. But for a bigger design, you actually don't want to go into that until there is some very exceptional and big problem because it will contain multi million games and you do not know where to start. So that is why I prefer text based at the command line interface, it gives a lot of reporting capability. The, the advanced uh, so DC expert is the basic synthesis tool, basic synthesis feature. The advanced is DC Ultra. What is being used into industry? We use DC Ultra. Uh, it is much more advanced version of DC expert. It does, apart from what DC expert does, it does, does an advanced arithmetic optimization, advanced delay optimization. It helps in critical path resynthesis, uh, register the timing, which is a very important feature. It, it helps us doing that. It does advanced, it has capabilities for advanced timing analysis. So you see a lot of advanced here. So it is just an advanced version of DC expert. It is also capable of running into uh, for big designs. Uh, it supports multi core execution for faster run times, which is very important for big designs. Uh, rest of the things are same as DC, DC expert. Um, but for the uh, scope of this project, actually, uh, DC expert should be sufficient. Unless and until you are going for a high speed design or something like that, um, DC expert should be sufficient. In this is a graphical user interface. Uh, uh, for this, is called design vision. Again, it's a separate feature, not a separate tool. So it provides analysis, viewing and analyzing designs at GTEC level. So uh, it provides menu, dialog boxes, drop down menus and so on, so on. but uh, I would recommend starting with and sticking with the, uh, the text based interface that is the command line interface, it will be much more intuitive than the graphical user interface. As you start practicing onto this, you will see the reason why. There is a feature called SDL compiler, so SDL compiler uh, it translates your Verilog and VSDL into GTEC. So again, you have uh, this SDL compiler is very much like a Verilog compiler, uh, what you might be using in your, in your other course. So for example, NC Verilog, this, this SDL compiler has a lot of those features. Plus, what it does now, your Verilog code will not be same. Uh, so not 100% of Verilog is not synthesizing. There are constructs which do not have any hardware equivalent. For example, uh, in Verilog, many times we write, we want to delay something, we write hash and a number. Let's say hash 5, hash 5 A is equal to B. That is B is assigning, being assigned to A after 5 units of delay. Now, this particular delay unit that is hash 5 has nothing equivalent to in hardware. That is, Yes, we have uh, hardware, we have buffers and inverters which we provide, which will give some amount play. But saying hash 5 will not result into some hardware. That is, this, this synthesis tool will simply ignore hash 5. So, this SDL compiler helps us in analyzing if our code, if our RTL code is actually synthesizable. It will give out warnings, it will give out errors if you have, if you have cases like this. So you could use this SDL compiler into correcting your design. There is a family of components called design with. Now uh, if you go back and remember that uh, recall that 
the process of a translation converts the RTL into a GTEC network, into a generic Boolean network. So, a designer library is a collection of reusable circuit design building blocks which are tightly integrated into Synopsis Synthesis Environment. So, let us say if you have the license for the C available, and let us say you write A plus B in your article code. Now, this plus, now assume the A and B, A and B to be let us say 8 bit. Now, what we are doing here is we are doing an 8 bit addition. That adder will not be a simple adder. Now, this designer library contains a lot of adders, ripple adder, you have carry look ahead, you have carry save, and so on. So, it implements all the all the all the adder architecture and you could use them or tell the tool by simply writing A plus B and also telling so if you write A plus B and simply synthesize if your design requirements are not too aggressive if you do not need a very fast adder it will pick up a ripple adder to implement by itself. Now you could tell the tool you could tell design compiler that do not use ripple adder it is slow use some other adder architecture so it will do that. So, a design will library is a collection of all such adder multipliers and so on there are lot of lot of components there. So, it contains a uh, lot of components which will help you in in designing complex circuits and it is very tightly integrated into synopsis synthesis model. So, during synthesis design compiler will select the right component with the best speed and area optimization from the design domain. Many times uh, you do not need to specify this in your RTL code, but I have seen people uh, they are very particular that uh, okay for example, uh, I would want that in all the cases my RTL code the multiplier I, multiplier I use should be a boost multiplier. So, I can actually specify in my uh, RTL that uh, for a multiplication operation I can say that if okay, use BW underscore mult 0 1. This is the name of a designer component. I could directly instantiate this in my Verilog and DC and Synopsis Design Compiler will pick it up and synthesize it. Uh, so, this is all uh, in the next uh, lecture. Uh, so, we what we saw, let us review a bit. So, we saw uh, what the process of synthesis is, it combines uh, the process of synthesis can be broken into three parts. Translation, mapping, and optimization. The translation is simply conversion of your RTL code into a generic Boolean netlist. The process of mapping and optimization actually converts that Boolean netlist into a specific technology library netlist and further optimizes based on the goals you provide. We saw that we can the goals you provide are timing, area, and power. Assuming all the design rules are met in that order of priority. So, we will see uh, next lecture we will look into the library, the standard cell library, what types of standard cells are there, how is timing and area information represented, how to read that, it is very, very important. Then we will start, we will begin with the RTL code. We will see how we will see the good practices of RTL coding for synthesis, we will see the process of synthesis. We will spend a lot more time on writing the constraints, writing how to write, how to mention the clock, how to set timing goals, how to set area goals, and so on. Thank you.